There's a principle of um, f of good fortune, which is uh, a timeless uh, principle. The true author of the Shakespeare plays was not Shakespeare; it was Christopher Marlowe. And because Christopher Marlowe not never got the credit, we own the plays, and that's what makes them their legacy lasts so long and will last another 400 years on top of the 400 years they've lasted already. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi teaches transcendental meditation in, this, in a similar manner. He never takes the credit. He always gives credit to his master and teaches in the name of his master. And for that reason, most of all, his teaching will flourish for a long time. Well, I haven't succeeded very well in understanding free energy until I understood and assimilated what something what Eric Dollard had s mentioned in one of his lectures that's on YouTube that Aaron Murakami put up on his YouTube channel. He mentioned the um, transatlantic telegraph cable problem of the uh, late 1800s and how El Oliver Heaviside was the only one who figured out the solution. And everybody else had the wrong solution. And he added, Eric added the, the little anecdote that uh, Oliver Heaviside was thanked in a most ungratuitous manner. He was crucified by the Royal Society of London to which he belonged. And he was so disgusted that he painted his uh, nails pink. He threw the furniture out of his home onto the front lawn or front yard of his home and uh, slept on rocks and the neighbor children stoned him every time he left his house to such a degree that he stopped leaving his house and he starved to death literally so that's the thanks he got for solving a fundamental problem and it was only not until I understood the significance of what he had done in conjunction with a criticism that I received at Stack Exchange that I understood the problem with free energy and why we don't have it. Conventional wisdom understands free energy, but they don't call it that because they don't think it's useful. Uh, they call it reactants. And the definition at Wikipedia, if you look up the article on reactants, they actually say that it's the resistance that a circuit offers to the current or whatever that's coming into it, the various components. It's the resistance, you know, inductive reactance or whatever. It's probably the main reason why they call it that. But regardless, that's what they, how they define it. Right up front in the opening sentence, in the opening paragraph, they call it the, the resistance the circuit offers. And yet, it's the dominant energy of the universe. And the New Age-minded people, uh, through no fault of their own, call it the ether. And Tesla had his own nomenclature. He called it radiant energy. But Oliver Heaviside apparently was the first one to call it reactants, and then Steinmetz went and further and mathematically modeled it and divided it into its various components of capacitive reactants and inductive reactants and really popularized the term. I didn't know that uh, Oliver Heaviside, you know, according to Wikipedia, uh, Oliver Heaviside is the reason for the term reactants, but Steinmetz is the one that Eric Dollard claims was the one who uh, really put forward the idea of reactants as opposed to radiant energy, even though they're the same thing. Now, the universe dominates in reactants because reactants is a kind of disheveled confusion of energy. It's, it's a proto-energy. It's not really energy as we know it. It's a hodgepodge. You know, there's a funny expression, uh, a line in the script of the movie uh, Michael with um, John Travolta. He plays Arch a Archangel Michael, <coughs> who's come to Earth to help a few people, and he he uh, says he invented lines, waiting in lines, because people were just milling around and, and it was a state of confusion, and he invented waiting in line. <laughs> so he, he likes to claim in the movie he invented a few things. Um, in fact, at one point I think he, he says, well, just kidding, you know, <laughs> he made up one. Um, 
be that as it may, um, if it were not for a conductor such as a, a piece of wire, all these disheveled proto-energies would not come together and unite to form energy as, w as we know it. And that means any an energy, whether it's nuclear energy or mechanical energy or electrical energy, unless there's something that that serves as a place, a meeting ground, for which all of these disparate proto factors or forces of energy can come together as ingredients to form a pie of energy, as Eric Dollard likes to express it, we don't get the pie. We don't get the energy. And as soon as the union breaks down, because it's very tenuous, then we don't have energy anymore. And that's why it looks like any energy disappears, even though all it did was break down into its component constituent ingredients. So the conservation of energy is upheld in a sense. Um, Except, <laughs> well, I don't want to get into that. That's a conservation of energy is a waste of time to even think about as a concept. Um, anyway, because it's kind of irrelevant. <laughs> um, anyway, um, the point of this video is that I redid my book. I uh, changed the title. I changed the cover image. Um, and I redid the introduction to reflect the fact that really it's Oliver Heaviside that I have to thank for making free energy possible because as somebody on Air, uh, Energetic Forum had s already stated, and I didn't really understand it at the time, it was a few years ago I read about it, he said you have to collect radiant energy and then you have to process it by passing it through a coil. Now I don't remember what kind of coil he, he, he mentioned, whether it was air core or iron core, and it does make a difference. Because in my device, if I can find my keyboard, in my device, the latest one I've developed, it requires air core coil. Well, these are actually not air core coils. But these do not create usable energy because they can't carry a load. They create a lot of reactive power of two oppositional types, capacitive and inductive reactants. And when they blend together, they create a lot of negative power factored uh, reactants, which is still not useful for doing anything because it can't carry a load. Not until I add a transformer, which is loss-oriented, <laughs> can I carry loads, inductive loads, really loads that matter, loads that move the world, loads that can rotate a motor, a DC motor. Whereas the development, the prior development of the circuit could easily carry a resistive load because, other than an LED, because a resistive load doesn't care what you give it. If you give it AC or DC or, in this case, pulsed AC. And in according to the theoretical uh, supposition or preposition of, uh, of this uh, simulation, it, it's a lot of power this uh, inductive load, this circuit can carry f as an inductive load. Uh, half a gigawatt, that's a lot of resistive load. The inductive load, not so much 50 kilowatts, but still that's pretty good for DC inductive load. Anyway, I have to thank, first of all, the people at uh, Stack Exchange for criticizing me, and Eric Dollard for promoting Oliver Heaviside in one of his lectures, because it was only when I took their criticism seriously, and then I have realized somehow, I don't know how it came to me, to uh, apply what Eric Dollard had mentioned about Eric, uh, excuse me, about Oliver Heaviside, that it's not about voltage. It's not about brute force. You know, I always look, oh, wow, well, look at all the power here, but you can't use it because it can't carry a load. Well, the minute you add a transformer, you can carry a load. And what's a transformer? It's an iron core coil that is along the same lines of what er Oliver Heaviside uh, did in solving the uh, transatlantic cable problem. He mentioned, you know, first he invented the telegrapher's equations, and then from that he deduced that they have to wrap the insulated copper cable that they were laying down in the, o in the Atlantic Ocean with iron ribbon or iron wire, and then insulate the whole package and to, bo to boost the magnetic component of the signal. 
to help it carry further, to preserve it, actually, to preserve the magnetic signal, to make it last longer, because it was dying out too quickly. And they thought, oh, let's just boost... Th the Ferrante solution was to boost the voltage at the sender's end. And he wasn't the only one. The Royal Society of London was suggesting the same thing. And there was a fellow in the, Ameri in the States, the United States, who was also agreeing. They all agreed on the same thing, you know, and it's the wrong way to do it because it still did not work. The signal would uh, uh, take a long time to reach the opposite end of the ocean. It would take longer and longer each time they sent it. And eventually it didn't even s reach the opposite end at all. It just faded out of existence because they were getting the electric field, but they were not getting the magnetic field being transferred across the ocean along the cable. The magnetic field was dying out too quickly. So ra uh, sending the signal across two types of wires did the job. And it, amazingly enough, I never understood the rationale, but shortly after uh, Oliver Heaviside solved this problem, we read in the patent of Nathan Stubblefield, his earth battery, he used two wires. One was copper, <coughs> insulated with, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> insulated with a cotton sleeve, and a bare iron wire was the other wire. And I could never figure out what that was for, but now I know why. Because he was, he was doing the right thing. <laughs> So not until I took that knowledge to heart was I able to apply it and then simplify the circuit down to the point that it's really ridiculously simple. It has so few wire connections that are, you know, I had too many before that I didn't need. And I had to figure out also that all these coils have to be lined up, their polarization, their winding has to be all the same, and they have to be all on an iron core. That makes them a s lumped solenoid group of coils, not lumped merely lumped inductors, because lumped inductors means air core coils, while lumped solenoids implies iron core. But still, they're lumped. They're not a transformer, per se. Not that I know the difference between the two. Once you get iron involved, I figure it's, hey, it looks the same to me. But it's not. The simulator doesn't treat it the same, and the, the conventional realists don't either. So obviously, the simulator and the conventional people who are formally trained in this matter, which I am not, they both know something I do not know, and so I have to take it on faith until uh, such time as I do know what the hell they're talking about. But I took it on faith, and I took it seriously, and it did the job, and that's what matters. Now my circuit can carry a load, and it can carry a lot of load when it comes right down to it, enough to power an EV, and light up a whole neighborhood of uh, street lights and light bulbs and heaters. I mean, it can really put out a lot of fantastic amount of power for the teensy little three volts that it pumps into the circuit. 20,000 uh, cycles per second of three volts sine wave. That's a big gain of energy. Uh, I don't even want to think about what the coefficient of performance is. 100 nanowatts pumped in and all this energy coming out of it that's a lot of power. So I have to thank Oliver Heaviside via Eric Dollard for giving me the solution because the solution, you know, the bottom, everybody thinks about the bottom line. They don't think about the causative factors. They could care less. All they think about is whether or not they get paid, you know, at the end of the month, the end of the day, d uh, where's my paycheck, you know? And that's the reality of electrical engineers by and large. All these young people, they just want to get paid at the end of the day. It's just a job to them. They don't want to think about the fundamentals involved or do research or think th for themselves any original thinking. They just want to take their authority figures on faith and leave it at that and do their work and get paid. So all their concern at Stack Exchange was, what's it good for? So what? You're creating all this reactant. So what? What's it good for? It's not good for anything. Well, now I know it is once I do the conversion via Oliver Heaviside's solution. Then, all of a sudden, it's useful. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so because uh, reactance dominates the universe, I figured this uh, big rock at Yosemite was a very appropriate image to convey that thought and remake my 
you know, give a, a little gloss over a remake job on my ebook and uh, post my second this second edition on Amazon and and elsewhere for free. In fact, I I've, I even have it at uh, archive.org now. Uh, that seems to be the best place to put things. Um, less complaints about whether or not you can download it, you know, uh, without somebody asking for your credit card like at Scribe D or uh, uh, Google Playbooks having problems with their software um, displaying the uh, book. Anywho, um, that's all I guess I wanted to say. I have to give full credit to Oliver Heaviside for the solution because the, the problem is not creating free energy. Anybody can do that. Oh, there's one other thought, and this is very significant. And Eric Dollard mentions it, and I've seen it happen time and time again. Ever since I started working with simulators, uh, beginning with Paul Falstead's simulator, it's a very peculiar phenomenon, and I could never understand it. But according to Eric Dollard, he explains it, so I'm just going to tell you the way he explains it. Reactive power... You see, let's combine it now with the, criti with the criticism coming from the, my critics over at Stack Exchange. What's it good for? It's lossless. They called it lossless energy. And you can't use lossless energy because usable energy has to be loss-oriented. It has to comply with the laws of thermodynamics. It has to be entropic. It has to be loss-oriented. Because if you can't lose it, you can't spend it. And if you can't spend it, what's it good for? <laughs> it's like money in the bank, but you don't have access to it. It just sits there and makes you look wealthy, but you don't get to spend it. What's it good for? Well, it makes you a lot of friends, maybe, <laughs> who might look forward to the prospect of uh, riding the coattails of your wealth. Uh, without ever getting, you know, without ever getting uh, the cashing in on the benefit, you know that reminds me of another movie, um, Jack Benny, and that famous redhead actress. I forget her name. She played in uh, How Green Is My Valley. Uh, but she, uh, the, both of them were in this movie. Uh, George Washington slept here, and it's a cute little movie, and it's all about them moving out to the country to a country home that's really in dilapidated condition and they have to fix it up well their uh, wealthy uncle comes to visit and he makes the rounds all his uh, nieces and nephews he he hangs out he takes turns who he hangs out with and he always promises them that when he dies they'll all get a chunk of his wealth and it turns out He's not wealthy at all. He's dirt poor. He's poorer than his nieces and nephews. That's why he's, he's, he's farming off of them, you know, hanging out with them, because he doesn't have a dime to himself. And, you know, he lost... The movie was made, I think, in the 40s. And so his excuse was, well, he lost all his money in the, in the stock market crash. But he kept his uh, mailing address at the company he used to work for. They, it's a small little gift they gave him, a benefit, and he makes these business cards to make it look like he still works there or owns the company or whatever, but he's dirt poor. And so when Jack Benny and his wife find out they're aghast and they get drunk on apple cider to celebrate that they're all in a shitty condition, <laughs> they're, Jack Benny and his wife are going to lose the home and, and they're not going to see any money to preserve their home because they're going to lose it due to the mortgage. Uh, they overspent themselves fixing up the place. They can't even pay the mortgage anymore, so they're going to lose the home. They were expecting to get money from their rich uncle. So um, it's a funny little movie. So now, why did I bring that up? Oh, I keep forgetting. Sometimes I get off in these tangents. Um, oh, so reactive power is lossless. Yet it has a very peculiar quality. Because it is lossless, not only does it accumulate because it can't be spent, it can't be lost, it can't be wasted. There's no ma magnetic hysteresis in, a in an iron core coil that can lose, well, this one does. <laughs> but these don't for some reason. So a lumped solenoid for some reason does not s lose the energy, but an iron cord transformer does. So don't ask me why, I don't know, but that's the way it is. And so that's why 
Oliver Heaviside solution is to put this in so you can spend it. But let me get to the important point, though. So the interesting thing about reactive power is not only does it accumulate, but its rate of accumulation accelerates as it accumulates. In other words, the more you have, the faster you get more of it. It's a very peculiar property. In other words, its momentum is not based on the input alone. See, if we take out a reactive power from the equation, which is the way we mostly function, we don't think about reactive power. We, Wikipedia calls it resistance. Well, all we think about is, oh, brute force, the Ferranti effect. Let's throw more voltage at this transformer modeling a motor and let's give it lots of power, lots of voltage to power our EV. And then it drains our batteries like heck, especially when we're trying to drive up a hill. You know, when you go from 1,000 feet to 4,500 feet to get to the ski lodge, as what I uh, tried to do on several occasions when I was living in Washington State, it chews up your battery pack really fast. And the people behind you don't want you to drive slowly. They want you to drive at a normal pace because they're driving gasoline cars. So you're driving at a normal pace, and it takes 25 minutes to get up the hill. And by the time you get, get up to the hill, you can forget about going anywhere except downhill. And I was lucky to live at the base of the hill. So all I got to do was turn around, coast my way back, and recharge my batteries 5%, because that's all I got with, from regenerative braking, and end up going back to my home and immediately plug in and recharge. If I tried to go into town, because I was four miles out of town, I ran the risk of depleting my battery pack to the point of zero and never making it home. I, I literally, that was the risk. So I, I took that risk one time and I, I regretted it. Um, I had AAA so they could tow me, but still, it's, it's not a nice story. Anywho, going up a hill, you really find out how quickly an electric car can lose its charge from its batteries, because that's what we do. We don't think about reactive power as a second source, not as a second, but as a, a major source of energy. <clears throat> we, all we think about is our primary source of energy, our voltage, our battery pack, feeding our motor, and then we deplete it really quickly. Because that's all we can do, is a direct line of connection, and it depletes. It's, a one, it's like... You know, in the old days, the medical profession made a big deal about how to cure people of any ailment. They, they, they believed in bleeding you. You know, they would cut you with knives, or they would use leeches. And they thought, oh, this is all the rage. You know, this will cure you of anything, you know, whatever ails you. And Paracelsus came along, a Swiss uh, physician, and he got crucified because he didn't believe in bleeding people. You know, he's like Oliver Heaviside. He was crucified because he... He said, well, you know, if it doesn't work, why do it? You know, <laughs> I, <laughs> what's the point? You know, Trevor Constable said the same thing. Uh, results count. Nothing else counts. So these people who do the right way get crucified, and then the people who do it the wrong way get, uh, well, whatever. We, we don't have to go there. <laughs> anyway, so what happens is if by putting in this middle area, in between the sine wave generator and the load, this area of building up reactive power and then a way to regulate it so it doesn't blow up in your face, because it will, it can. The funny thing about reactive power is it's not entirely based on the voltage supplying it. It's partly due to that, but actually the voltage supplying it gets in the way of it building up. It'll kill it. So I have to make sure I don't provide it too much voltage input. Very little. Depending on the size of the circuit determines how much voltage I give it. I've done other circuits in which I've tried to do a table model. You know, something for like uh, an appliance, like a blender or an ice cream machine maker. And the, vo the voltage output has to be so low that the input has to be reduced considerably below 3 volts. In this case, you know, I try to go for the max, or not for the max, but, you know, a, a nice large amount. And so I can get away with inputting 3 volts, but I can't for a table model. I have to put in microvolts, or else I smother the reactive element of the circuit with all that voltage. I suppress it, so it doesn't get a chance to grow. 
if we allow transients, which are reactive in their, by their nature, to grow and develop and nurture them thusly, they have a peculiar quality in that the voltage supplying them, the stimulation to grow in the first place, is not the true factor for their growth. It actually gets in the way if we give them too much voltage. What helps them is their own momentum. Their own momentum becomes their own force of growth, such that the more, and plus they're lossless, so the more energy they accumulate that's not getting spent, that becomes their primary source of impetus for their growth rate. So that the more energy they accumulate, the faster they grow. It's a, and it's logarithmic. It's exponential. It's a geometric uh, growth rate. And this is what Eric Dollard has said, and I've seen it time and time again in every simulation I've done in which I've created a surge-oriented circuit. It grows at an exponential rate. You can watch it happen, and the numbers, you know, the, the uh, scientific notation uh, labels on my oscilloscope output for the simulator in, in Paul Falstead's simulator will change, you know. They'll change from yoke toe, you know, to the next one up. I can't remember what it is. And, you know, eventually it gets to fem toe and then, uh, no, it gets to atto and then fem toe and pico and, you know, nano and micro and milli and kilo and mega and, and on and on and on. Yet the rate of the digits changing remains the same. Now, you would think it would slow down, right? I've seen some do slow down, and then I stay away from them because those are not the kind of cir surge-oriented circuits I want to deal with. I want the kind that grow exponentially. And so I focus on those, and that's the skill I've developed is to f simply focus on the exponential growth rate-oriented surge uh, style circuitry. And so... The numbers, the digits, the change of the digits remains the same rate, except the scientific notation label keeps changing at also the same rate, which means it's logarithmic. It's like looking at a slide rule. You know, my brother it was seven years older than me, so he's in his, uh, well, he's nearing uh, his 70. Yeah, he's, he's almost uh, 70 years old. And in his day and age, when he went to high school and college, they, they didn't have calculators. That was in my day, you know, they invented calculators. But in his day, they had slide rules. And if you watch the movie uh, with Tom Hanks, Apollo 13, they're busy with their slide rules trying to figure out the math to uh, get them home safely. That's all they had, you know. They had big mainframes, but for uh, pocket calculation, all they had were slide rules. Well, you know, the Orientals, the, the Asians, they had uh, abacuses. But, and they could work them real fast. Well, anybody with a slide rule knows how to work it real fast, too. Uh, amazingly, uh, it's uh, reflex-like. Uh, they really learn how to work it. But be that as it may, um, that's a sidebar, <laughs> which is not really relevant. Um, l watching the growth rate is like watching a slide rule in action because that's what it is. You know, a slide rule is basically a logarithmic ruler. And I if you've ever seen one, you know, I I check them out. They're really, it's, a, it's quite an antiquated antique item, but it's kind of interesting to look at. Um, because that's what the growth rate is of a surge-oriented, transient, reactive, uh, reactance um, growth rate of a circuit. I it's logarithmic. It, it's, it's amazing. And I don't know what the actual growth rate is. I've read that it's the factor of 2, not 10, um, in actuality. And so I think it's really a, a product of the simulator that makes it look like it's a factor of 10 because its simulators are built to run in base 10 number system. But whenever I read about parametric uh, excitation or amplification, excitation, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, and Eric Dollar does talk about parametric excitation, but when you read up on it from other sources, they say the growth rate is a factor of 2, not 10 or something else. So I don't know what the growth rate is in actuality. But be that as it may, I've seen the growth rate vary. It can be very different. It can vary wild, wild, wildly, widely. In fact, it can be instantaneous, and you'll never know. 
you, you can shrink down the time frame of the simulator as far as you like to go, as far as the simulator will let you go, and you still will not see the surge occur. It'll be instantaneous explosion of instant, infinite power. So there, there I, I think it is possible that in some instances, um, or in many instances, the growth rate varies, and in some instances, it's instantaneous, it's so fast. Um, so that's why it's important when you're dealing with this to try to regulate it and try to keep it within a certain tolerable limit of growth rate because it can get out of hand and explode in your face. Be that as it may, we, uh, uh, going back to the main theme, we have to thank, I have to thank Oliver Heaviside and so that's why I felt it was necessary to give a facelift to my ebook by just merely changing the, the introduction and the cover art and the uh, title. So this is not the actual title. <laughs> I, I've got all kinds of titles mixed up, you know. It's, it's hard for me to decide on any one title because it's hard to put into a, 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 an exact, succinct phrase exactly what I'm trying to say because I'm trying to say too much. And I'm forced, because of the limitation of titles, to use too few words to say it, to succinctly put it in words. So this is the image I use for a uh, Vimeo video, um, and I thought I, I include, I do the audio for that video, and I include it in the introductory chapter, and so you can play the audio from the ebook itself, or you can click on the link to go to Vimeo to play the video version of that audio track, and it just has this image that you just see this image for the entire track. It's an hour long. Um, but I thought I'd do this video to give thanks to Oliver Heaviside because he really deserves it. You know, he, he, lived, he died a horrible death, you know. <laughs> it's a ter terrible way to die, um, to live out the remainder of his life and, and the th kind of thanks he got. Um, anywho, on that sour note is not a nice note to end on, but I, I, do, des I, do, he do, I do have to give him credit. You know, I've given Eric Dollard, Byron Brubaker, and other people credit, but Oliver Heaviside really, he was the last chink in the puzzle. And the one that matters, because that's all that matters to people, is payday, the bottom line. You know, what's it good for? Is the conversion of, can it be, can the reactants be converted into useful energy? Because all the electrical engineers know how to create free energy. They just don't call it free energy. They call it reactants. They call it useless resistance. So this is their stumbling block. And Oliver Heaviside solves their stumbling block. Otherwise, we'd have free energy all over the place if it wasn't for this stumbling block that they are programmed to believe in so highly. And it's no small wonder because if we crucified Oliver Heaviside back in his day, it's no small wonder that he's not fully made use of in today's world to solve the problem of free energy and make it fully available to everyone and change the economy, change the human universe on this planet. It's amazing. You know, we, c we think of Tesla this, Tesla that, and other people like to think Einstein this, Einstein that. But in reality, uh, Patrick uh, Kelly, is that his name? Patrick Kelly over at uh, Free Energy over at, uh, in the UK, you know, the famous website uh, about free energy, he uh, kind of turned my head around because I thought Einstein invented the E equals MC squared equation. He said, no, Oliver Heaviside invented it. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so Oliver Heaviside invented reactants. I didn't know that either. Wikipedia informed me about that when I looked up the article on reactants. So Oliver Heaviside is responsible for a lot of things. His resume on the Wikipedia article regarding his telegrapher's equation or his, no, his biography article, I believe it's his biography article, they uh, list a lot of accomplishments that he accomplished in his lifetime in the societies that he belonged to besides the Royal Society of London that crucified him eventually. He, he uh, accomplished a lot. Um, so I don't know. What can I say? I don't know what more to say, you know. Um, I keep pushing my um, anthology of free energy, but um, always trying to give it a facelift, a new angle of view, 
once every time I learn something new about it. Um, and so this is the latest, to give credit where credit is due, because the guy deserves it. And strangely enough, as luck would have it, um, the son who I lost, uh, was his middle name is Oliver. And um, so <laughs> the other uh, peculiarity is that our son's birth date is on the uh, Latino Mother's Day, which is also the birthday of uh, Fred Astaire. So it, it was kind of an interesting confluence of uh, factors, but his middle name is Oliver. So anyway, for what it's worth. Oh, yeah, so, so the, <laughs> the reason why I bring it up is because it was the loss of my son that drove me to uh, pursue teaching myself electrodynamics through the use of simulators. And interestingly enough, Oliver Heaviside was self-taught on electrical engineering. He was not formally trained. So <laughs> it's like, whoa, it really does take people who have the motivation to teach themselves something who go out and solve problems. Instead of the ones who go get a formal education, I don't know, do they solve problems sometimes? You know, the, the, the learning process doesn't kill their, their instinct to uh, go further than what they've been taught. Um, it all depends why somebody goes into the, into the field in the first place, what motivated them, I suppose. Um, I don't know. <laughs> All I know is um, I'm certainly not making any money off of this, and um, even though people call it a scam, <laughs> the only reason why I put it on Amazon is to protect it and to make sure nobody removes it. They can remove it from public domains, and that's t happened already a few times. But uh, at least on Amazon, it can't be because it's private property. So that's the only reason why I put it there. <laughs> I'm not I, sure. I thought I could make a buck too, but nobody buys it, so <laughs> I'm not making any money. To, you know, once in a while, somebody w might, you know, I, so I, g great, I make a dollar or a two, but uh, I don't make any money off of this. This is all uh, free will offering as far as uh, I can see. Anywho, I hope you enjoy the video for what it's worth, <laughs> despite my little bit of griping there. Thank you, Eric Dollard, for informing us about Oliver Heaviside. <laughs>